We are a rowdy group. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, we, uh, we come to the final presentation in this four-part presentation on the Catholic Church's uh, doctrine of social teaching. Uh, I, I think uh, this is where it converges, uh, at least that's what I'm going to try to do, put it all together for you. And uh, this final presentation is, um, I, I don't know if it's the most important element in the, the series, but it, it might be the most timely, the most relevant, it's on our minds. Uh, going to talk about uh, the economic component of the church's social teaching and uh, socialism. Socialism and the social teaching of the Catholic Church. Socialism has been defined uh, many different ways, but let me read you one definition. A system of social and economic organization that would substitute state monopoly for private ownership of the sources of production and the means of distribution and would concentrate under the control of the secular governing authority the chief activities of human life. Now some might say, well, that hasn't happened. No. Um, but it, it, it won't happen all at once. You have to be vigilant. You don't want to wake up one morning and find out that your way of life has evaporated. That's not the legacy you want to hand on to your children and your grandchildren. Now, I'm, I'm kind of like you. I, I've, uh, in recent months, in years, I've had lots of conversations with people, friends, and so forth, and uh, I, I find myself, and I, I hate to say it, but I, I have frequently said, and I never thought I would say it, you know, I'm glad I'm older rather than younger. You know, you know what I mean, I think, uh, when I say that, and, and, I, and I'm sorry to say that, actually. I, that's not a pleasant thing. I do not believe at this juncture in time, although we can always change the course of history, but at this juncture of time, I do not believe that our children and grandchildren will have the same opportunities that we had in the United States of America and in the Western world in general. Governments, societies, and systems rise and fall. The crowns are exalted one day and they roll in the dust the next day. To the degree that we act in accordance with our true nature, we prosper. To the degree that we do not act in accordance with the dignity of our human nature, well, predictable results can be expected. In my lifetime, let's say the last half century or more, uh, we've seen some changes, to be certain, in our way of life. But in the last few years, the changes have become exponential. Things have changed so fast. Now, change isn't necessarily bad, <clears throat> but it can be. Change can be good or bad. You know, you can make progress or regress. You can go forward or backward. We make advances in technology and then we lose ground in theology. You know, we, we, we lose our morals and make more money. If a man should gain the whole world, Jesus said, and lose his eternal salvation, what would it profit him? So we've had in my estimation anyway, and I, can, and I could give you lots of examples and proof of it, we have been sliding backwards in America, and not only in America, Europe's worse 
Believe me, most of Europe is worse than America. You know, Canada, I think, is worse than America. Um, the moral demise of a nation always precedes the ultimate demise of a nation. When you begin to unravel morally, and by the way, that happens one person at a time. That's not some collective phenomenon. One person at a time, we begin to lose it. And then, of course, that manifests in society. We've had a traumatic time, I would say, in the past, say, the last decade or so. <clears throat> Look at what's happening. The last 10 years have really been something. You know, if you um, figure 9-11, okay, Maybe use that as a starting point, if you like. Um, or let's say, well, yeah, that decades since Y2K. <laughs> remember that? We, everybody was all excited at that term, Y2K. Remember that? Everybody, ooh, the, the ch turn of the millennium is going to be a, uh, who knows what's going to happen. It's going to be, <clears throat> and then no uh, instantaneous cataclysmic thing happened at midnight when the millennium changed. However, look what's happened in the last 10 years. 2001, you know. 9-11, that, that tragedy. And then all of the economic and social upheaval that we've seen. I, I think something happened to us. I don't know if it's not some kind of collective post-traumatic stress sim syndrome the country suffered from. I was, uh, I was at my father's funeral. I was celebrating my father's funeral in Los Angeles on September 11, 2001. My goddaughter called me 5.30 in the morning and said, turn on the television, something terrible's happening. And I saw the second plane hit live. When the second plane hit, I, I had the television on, as many of us probably did. <clears throat> and then I went and buried my dad. We couldn't get back to the airport because there was gridlock in downtown Los Angeles. I had to point the rental car north, and I drove six hours to go back where I lived at the time in Northern California. <clears throat> a lot has happened in the last 10 years. The last couple of years, we've seen an economic meltdown. People work their entire life to achieve the American dream, and then they find out at retirement age they can't make ends meet. Social Security, their pension, not enough. We have people in my area, I mean, unemployment rate, if you count underemployment, comes out to about 20% where I live. So one out of five people is unemployed. They've been living on their savings or unemployment insurance, but that's running out. People have been paying their bills with credit cards. And then to pay the credit cards, they pay with more credit cards. <clears throat> you know, that, that's a Ponzi scheme. The next thing to crash will be the credit card companies. Real estate is going, it, it's being foreclosed upon at an alarming rate. The last thing in the world a bank should want to do is to be an owner of real estate. That's not what banks do but they're getting the property back, and then they can't sell it, so it sits there and deteriorates. I live in a <clears throat> pretty nice part of the world, and, uh, you know, I'm kind of like you. you know, people don't realize I, I have a different situation. I'm, as some of my friends say, you're odd. Indeed. <laughs> I am. <laughs> I am, I, am a, I am a weird priest, no doubt. I'm probably one of the few priests you know that rides a Harley fat boy, has a permit to carry a concealed weapon. 
gets, de gets death threats every other month and doesn't mind it too awfully much. So all these things have been happening. I've lost probably, you know, I'm, a lot of people misunderstand, oh, well, the church takes care of all your needs. No, the church has never paid me. I've never received a salary from the church. I've never received food, housing, clothing, medical insurance from the church. No, I'm like you. You know, it's called, I got to work for it, and then I pay for it, just like you. I have to work. I have to, you know, paid the mortgage payment for, I don't have a mortgage anymore for the simple reason that you know, one of the things I did in my spare time, I started to tell you before, is that one of the lawsuits, one of the, probably one of the biggest medical fraud lawsuits in United States history, I was the lead plaintiff, worked with the FBI and the U.S. attorney, and uh, stopped a um, unnecessary heart surgery fiasco that was going on. And so, uh, <clears throat> you know, I helped the taxpayers recover $54 million of their money, which had been used to Medicare fraud. So that, that, that was just, you know, that was like my part-time job for four years. And uh, <clears throat> I wouldn't highly recommend it because it's time-consuming, but I'm glad we did it because we stopped that. Uh, almost a thousand people got about a billion dollars in settlement payments for unnecessary heart surgery. The corporation lost about mm, almost 54 billion with a B in equity value. And I felt bad for the shareholders, but uh, you know, they were doing bad things to good people. So I paid off my mortgage when I got Uncle Sam's money. You know, I was a whistleblower. So I did a prudent thing, and I'm glad I did it. And you should live that way too. And I know you try to do that. You're, you're sensible people. But can you imagine, ask yourself this. If you lived like the United States government presently manages its affairs, wouldn't you soon be bankrupt? Right? If you conducted your household affairs like the government of many countries, including the United States, conduct their affairs, would it not be reasonable to assume that you would be insolvent almost immediately and bankrupt soon if you couldn't print money? And if you can print money, Rampant inflation has to be just around the corner because there is no law of economics that says otherwise. It has to happen. Americans have lost 30, 40 percent of their net worth in the twinkling of an eye, and you work years to accumulate that. People, my generation, the baby boomers, you know, a lot of us are about to retire and can't. You know, plenty of people, they work 30 years, well, they get their retirement, Social Security, and then they have to be greeters at Walmart to make ends meet. I see it every day. I have family members who were teachers and taught in schools for 30 years and more. And they thought, well, with our Social Security and our teachers' retirement fund will be okay. Pay off the house, travel. Why not, you know? And then they find out we don't have it. Our 401k lost half its value, 30% of its value. And then you look at the system and you think, look what they did, and people get angry. And you can't blame them. So we have this economic meltdown, which is largely the result of ex the excesses of capitalism. I could say capitalism run amok, but it's really immorality run amok. 
because there's, there's, uh, there's fraud and corruption behind it. Didn't happen by accident. Don't believe that for a minute. Somebody profited from it. Then what? Then what? Then the tendency in human nature is to gravitate to the other extreme. You know, first we have runaway capitalism, which doesn't take into account the dignity of human persons, would hold them to merely be cogs in the wheels of the economic system. That crashes. And then the tendency for the pendulum to swing to the other extreme. And what is that? It's socialism. You see, the people couldn't handle it. Private enterprise can't be trusted to take care of its own affairs. Therefore, the government will usurp the power and will manage everything because the people aren't competent to manage their own affairs. That is in process. Whether you believe it or not, or know it or not, that is in process. Now, this is nothing new. Uh, many would say that the beginnings of the, the present form of the Catholic Church's social teaching began with the encyclical Rerum Novarum in 1891. And at that time, you had the Industrial Revolution, you had the rapid change of society and economies, and the church felt morally moved to step in because workers were being abused. Uh, people were being abused for the sake of production. Pope Leo XIII writes in the beginning of, <clears throat> of that encyclical, and the language of, of that time was a little more flowery and different than what we'd use now, but he says, therefore, venerable brethren, as on former occasions when it seemed opportunity to refute false teaching, <clears throat> we have addressed you in the interest of the church and have issued letters bearing on political power, human liberty, the Christian constitution, Constitution of State Light Matters. Well, now we think it expedient to speak concerning the condition <clears throat> of the working classes. It is a subject on which we have already touched more than once, incidentally. <clears throat> but in the present letter, the responsibility of the apostolic office urges us to treat the question of set purpose and in detail. This discussion is not easy. It wasn't easy in 1891. It's not easy now either nor is it void of danger. It is a, no easy matter to define the relative rights and mutual duties of the rich and of the poor, of capital and of labor. And, the da and this is the part I, you know, how when you're in school you underline things or highlight them? You know, I still do that. So I've, I've got this, you can see it, I underlined it in red. And the danger lies in this that crafty agitators are intent on making use of these differences of opinion to pervert men's judgments and to stir the people up to revolt. What was happening? Well, the working class was abused. Capital, owners of companies were taking advantage of poor workers, and that was wrong. That was an immoral thing. So that should be remedied. However, there were certain people who wanted to capitalize upon that situation for their own political, social, and economic gain. And that is what the Pope is talking about here. This, this, this he said, is, is the problem, and he's, he says, to remedy, these, to remedy these wrongs, in other words, the wrongs that were taking place to the, to the workers of the time, the average person, the poor people. In order to remedy these wrongs, the socialists, working on the poor man's envy of the rich, are striving to do away with private property 
and contend that individual possessions should become the common property of all to be administered by the state or by municipal bodies. They hold that by thus transferring property from private individuals to the community, the present mysterious state of things will be set to rights, inasmuch as each citizen will then get his fair share of whatever there is to enjoy. <clears throat> Here's the part I like. But their contentions are so clearly powerless to end the controversy that were they carried into effect, the working man himself would be among the first to suffer. They are, moreover, emphatically unjust, for they would rob the lawful possessor, distort the function of the state, and create utter confusion. Socialists, therefore, by endeavoring to transfer the possessions of individuals to the community at large, strike at the interests of every wage earner, since they would deprive him of liberty and of disposing of his wages, and thereby of all hope and possibility of increasing his resources and bettering <clears throat> his condition of life. Socialism is a bankrupt system. Socialism never worked anywhere, anytime. Socialism reduces everybody. It doesn't help the poor. That's a fallacy. That is an absolute fallacy. Ultimately, socialism doesn't help the poor. Rather, it reduces everybody to the same lowest common denominator of poverty and misery, while at the very same time drying up the sources of capital. Where are the jobs going to come from? They're just going to materialize in the sky? <clears throat> I've read countless accounts from people that lived in socialist situations. <clears throat> the communist countries. I remember one written by a, a very notable physician who had grown up in one of the Eastern European countries. She said it was a terrible state of affairs. And it's the reason that alcoholism, drug addiction, and suicide skyrocketed in those countries. A lousy doctor is paid the same as a good doctor. A lousy farmer is paid the same as a good farmer. A horrible lawyer is paid the same as an excellent lawyer. All incentive for excellence is expunged. It's a miserable, depressing state of affairs. It is immoral, it is unjust, and it strikes at the very heart of human freedom. You remove incentive, you harm humanity. The Robin Hood principle, they think it's good. Well, don't be carried away by a nice, warm, fuzzy movie. Rob from the rich, give to the poor. That's a nice, fuzzy thought. And we've already said we do have to take care of the poor. But you don't rob someone of their lawful possessions in order to do it. There is such a thing as free will. Freely, we should do this. Should the government do something at some level? Yes, but as little as possible. But what will happen is when individuals don't live up to their obligations in conscience, when we don't act in a moral fashion, when we don't put God first, our neighbor second, when we don't love God above all things, then love our neighbor as ourselves, we take care of the poor, feed the hungry, house the homeless, what will happen? Well then, as a form of divine retribution, we will begin to lose what we have. You will lose your assets, 
you will lose your discretionary power and the government will gradually begin to take it and grow bigger and bigger and bigger and you will become less significant and less significant and less significant and you will depend upon the government for everything in life. And that is the personification of everything that's against the church's social teaching. This is a grave mistake and yet it's easy to misunderstand it because the, 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 the shallow thinker will say, well, yes, but we have to take the poor. Uh, therefore, you know, we, we'll take away your hard-earned money and, uh, you know, we'll increase the social services and then we'll give it to this person over there. No. Wrong. You do that, you will destroy the country. You don't believe it? Look at what's happened in Europe. They have, they have gone downhill fast. You don't believe that? Talk to some Europeans. I've talked to hundreds of them. That's happening. We ignore these principles to our own peril. Once again, socialism is not the answer. The principle of subsidiarity. You should not take from an individual what he's able to do for himself and give it to a higher authority. If I'm an able-bodied human being, then by golly, have some incentive, have some ambition, get out there and work. I remember my grandparents, my grandfather worked three jobs, 16 hours a day, and he took care of his family. Eighth grade education, Oh, yeah, yours did too. I know that. Not just mine. That was common, right? That's how, that's what made this country great. You work. And you work hard. This entitlement mentality is a plague. It's wrong. It is immoral. And it will result in the demise of nations, which is well underway. So what are we going to do about it? Well, the first thing you can do about it is learn this stuff and learn it well. Socialists, by endeavoring to transfer the possessions of individual to the community at large, strike at the interests of every wage earner. <clears throat> A lot of ways to do that. What's one of them? Increase taxes to the point where the government gets more than you do of your hard-earned money. I, I've had a, a thought for a while. I pay taxes, lots of them. And I always think of it, eh, I think it's already excessive, but mm, okay. Uh, all right. One for my partner, the government. One for me. One for my partner, the government. One, but when the day the government wants more than 50%, I'm going to be mightily aggravated. A friend of mine recently said, don't you realize it already is more? You know, if, if, if personal income tax, federal income tax, state income tax, sales tax, use tax, who knows whatever, uh, 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 an, an internet tax is common, by the way. I get regular notifications from the Census Bureau. They, they're keeping track of internet sales, and there'll be a tax on that. So there, there'll be all kinds of gasoline tax, this cigarette tax, tanning tax, <laughs> right? There will be more. Yeah, now they tax, you know, tanning salons, and, you know, people want to go in there and, and, and uh, get tan and, uh, and get some vitamin D or something, 10% uh, tax. So I don't know how much that costs. Say if it costs $10, a dollar of it immediately goes to the government. That will increase. There is a certain point where it becomes unjust. There is a certain point where then the government is supposed to do more for you than you are. That makes you lazy. 
That takes away incentive. And that really strikes at the heart of the first principle of the church's social teaching, and that concerns human dignity. You know, we've been conditioned rather gradually over time to think that not working, in a sense, is a value. Like, oh, I don't have to work anymore, you know, or I'm going to retire at the age of 30. I used to think that before I do what I do now, and I thought, eh, I want to retire when I'm 40. You know, then I can just travel or have fun or whatever. And I could have retired at the age of 35. When I was young, I made enough money in the real estate business, I could have retired when I was 35. Then, of course, I, I had a, um, a, a spurt of stupidity and, and lost it faster than I made it, uh, which sometimes happens to young, younger people and, and sometimes older ones, too. We've got to apply these things. A failure to do so will result in a failure for the country and a failure for your family, a failure to your children and your grandchildren. These things aren't insignificant. I'll tell you something. I'm not a politician, and I don't want to be involved in politics. But I have an obligation to be involved in what the church teaches. I don't tell you who to vote for. I, I wouldn't. But I have to help give you principles so you can form your conscience and then you make your decision on who you vote for. Voting involves one of those principles in Catholic social teaching. Remember? Family, community, participation. And that's one of the ways you participate. We get what we deserve. You know, people want to vote for things that are immoral, deleterious, and harmful to society. Then you get, you get what you deserve. Bad leadership is punishment for sin. The Old Testament has ample proof of that. You know, we keep it up under the specious pretext of freedom freedom of choice, freedom of expression. That's not freedom, that's license. And it's very harmful. Look, every one of you should win over at least 100 people between now and November. Really? I don't know how you're going to do it, how you, but, but, you know, it's like, make it happen. Just make it happen, because if you don't, we're all in big trouble. You can, it's not, oh, well, I'll, I'll vote. Okay, that's one. Good, good. I'm glad you will do the right thing. That's not good enough. We have, in, in our military, especially uh, in the... Uh, special operations groups, special forces in the Army, we have a term that, that they like to use called the force multiplier. And um, I've often thought of, uh, of how the special forces operate. They'll go into an area with, a, with a, an ODA, Operational Detachment Alpha, an A-team, and 12 men who are specialists in, in different areas, communications, weapons, and so forth, um, they'll go into an, to an area and they work with the indigenous population to win them over and then 12 men, then they, they could train a battalion or a division of the people. Force multiplier. Force multiplier. One of you, through your good example, your good life, your knowledge of the faith conveying that to other people, one of you can win over 10 people, 100 people, 1,000 people. That's a force multiplier. You, you, we're outnumbered. You have to do this. The failure to do it will result in an increasing catastrophe. So, do this. That's the mission. Okay, where, where are we? We're in July. Wow. July, 
August, September, October, November. You don't have much time. Better get busy. I don't know how you're going to do it, but I'll tell you what. Tools like the Internet are powerful. You know, it used to be if I wanted to say something, say something happened, uh, something happened next Tuesday, and I wanted to exert my influence or do something, what would I do? Well, I could maybe write a letter, <clears throat> send it out to my mailing list. Well, that's kind of weak. Well, maybe can you get on television or radio fast enough? Maybe. Probably not. Ah, internet, my website, email. I can reach millions of people almost instantaneously. And we're foolish if we don't. You have to use the means available. You've got to do this. A failure to put the principles and themes of Catholic social teaching into action results in predictable results. Humanity will suffer at every level. People's economic condition will suffer, their health will suffer, their morals will suffer, everything will suffer. That's how important it is. You know, uh, all that evil requires, and what we are dealing he with here is evil. Make no mistake about that. This can all be traced back to the battle between good and evil, truth and lies, light and darkness, life and death. That's what this is about. Life and death struggle. Let me say it as clearly as I can. Satan is the enemy. And I think he's a socialist, too. In plain English. Yeah, I know, I know. Some people don't like that. Tough. I, I have a right to my opinion, just like you have a right to yours, and that's an opinion. That's not a statement of fact, I, but it's based on fact, and I think I could support that contention. So what are you going to do? Okay, plan of action. Please, take the Catechism of the Catholic Church, prayerfully read the section on the Seventh Commandment. It's not that long. It's not bad. It won't take you that long. Meditate on that. Pray about that. Begin, if you're not doing it, begin to pray the rosary every day. It'll only take you 15, 20 minutes. Very powerful. Please do that. Please do that. You know, and if you have to, write these things down. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I write more lists than I used to. I have those little sticky note things, and I write down anything. I, can't, I don't remember things as well anymore, so I have to write them down, the little sticky notes. Then I've got to put a little sticky note up on my bathroom mirror to make sure I remember the ones on the kitchen counter. And thousands of people are shaking their heads. I'm not the only one. Make a plan. Plan of action, pray, receive the sacraments, make some little sacrifices, visit the sick, bring some food or money to the food bank. You know, where I live, I live in a pretty nice area. I don't live in an inner city area. I, I, I have to admit, I have it pretty good. I live in a nice small town in northwest Montana with mountains all around me, a ski area on the mountain up there. You know, right now it's as green as Ireland in the summer. Beautiful. And I go, sometimes I go to have breakfast at a local restaurant in the, uh, the food pantry for the town is right there. I have to go past it. And on uh, every week, I think it's Wednesday morning, People are lined up to get food because they don't have enough food to feed their families. Unemployment's 20 percent. People are running out of money. Now, I know we're, we're, all of us 
have limited means, but to the extent you can think about those things, you know? I, I can't drive past that place without doing something about it. The restaurant that I go to quite a bit, you know, they had a special dinner that, that profited the, the food pantry. So, you know, I went, I took my whole crew, and they had raffle tickets, you know, and we bought just about all of them. We won everything. <laughs> everything from golf balls to fishing lures and, you know, cakes, pies. Man, we were eating cakes and pies for weeks. Well, the proceeds went to, to buy food for hungry people. You can't ignore that. You know, I, I, after I was sick, you know, I, I tried to get better, started exercising, started to eat more sensibly. I lost 70 pounds. 70 pounds, that's a person. <laughs> it's almost a little person, you know. And, and so consequently, I had two bags full of fat clothes. Two big garbage bags full of large guy clothes. So, brought them, you know, down to the Salvation Army. It was the only place I could go, but they distribute them to people who need them. That was no big sacrifice on my part because I couldn't use the stuff anymore. Do things like that. Donate some of your time. You can't ignore this. If we ignore this, things will unravel. And don't think that what your little contribution is that it doesn't count. It counts. You help one person. You feed that person for a day. Or maybe you take some person under your wing, some disadvantaged person. You know, I see it all the time. You know, not everybody can do everything. Like, I do what I do, and I've been given my orders that I, my value to the church is up here, doing what I do. And, and I have kind of a standard operating procedure. I'm not allowed to do other things. I'm not allowed to get sidetracked. But a lot of other things are good, but you can do those things, you know? I'm not allowed to do spiritual direction. Is that a good thing? Yes, I once had 500 people. They said, stop it, because it takes away from the one thing that you really are valuable for, because very few people can do what I do up here. Other people can do that, and they should. So. I'm like a specialist, like a brain surgeon or something. I have, I have a very narrow mission. I don't do weddings. I don't do funerals. I don't do baptisms. Those are great things, magnificent things for a priest to do. But I don't do that. I'm kind of like in the tradition of St. Paul, who said, I, I'm thankful I didn't baptize any of you, because he knew he'd be responsible for them to to God. <laughs> he didn't, but he preached. He, he did what he did. I do what I do. You do what you do. Each one of us is different, but contribute to the same end. Many members of the body of Christ. One body, many members. You know, you've got the foot, the eye. I mean, they're all valuable, like St. Paul said. You know, uh, shall the hand exalt itself above the eye? No, believe me, you need them both. You need them both. I, you know, the world needs you. The world needs me. We all have our unique, precious, unrepeatable mission in history. You have a place on the battle line, and it's important. I remember once when I was preparing, when God dragged me out of the gutter, where I spent a good part of my life, I had a lot of spiritual experiences. I don't talk about them too much, and, and, uh, but I'd be a liar to say that they didn't happen. They did. Uh, I remember at one point I was having all these spiritual experiences, kind of pretty high spiritual, mystical experiences, and I went to my spiritual director at the time, and I said, oh, Father, I'm you know, I'm getting all these spiritual consolations, all these gifts, you know, all this wonderful thing. And, and you know, there's always the danger of a subtle pride developing. 
You know, we call it ascetical pride, spiritual pride. And I said, wow, why is God favoring me uh, with, with all of these uh, spiritual experiences? Is it because you're an utter basket case? <laughs> because you're, 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 you're like a bunch of disparate body parts in, in, a, in, a, in a basket and you can't do anything, so God has to give you these little consolations to keep you going. Another time I said to the founder of our congregation, I said, hey, Father, you know, everything's growing. I mean, I used to preach to hundreds, then thousands, then millions. You know, why, why, do, you, why do you think God has given me all those gifts? And he said, quite simply, because he couldn't find anybody worse. End of story. Yeah, right. But we have to use the talents that we've been given. All of these things you know. I don't think I've told you a whole lot you didn't know today. I think you know the, the essential elements of it. Somebody said to me one time, you know, you're preaching to the choir, these good people that you go and preach to, you're preaching to the choir. And, but uh, uh, Jesus preached to the choir too. Our job is to confirm the brethren. Your job is to go out and get the rest of them. You know, I remember in one of those spiritual experiences I alluded to, I had a kind of a mystical whatever it was, and I don't make a big deal out of those things because the reason I had those things is probably just what they said because I was a basket case. But it was like a war, a battle scene, fierce battle, like what we might call a forward operating base, perimeter, wall, and forces attacking, violent combat. And I was running from position to position, exhorting the troops. Mortar round would come in, blow up a machine gun off its position. I'd set it back up, pick up the soldier, encourage him, and move on to the next position around the perimeter. And the fire was intense coming in going from one place to the next, one soldier to the next, exhorting them. The room where we're staying in, in between the talks is the girls' locker room for the volleyball team here at Xavier. And they have some cool things on the wall, like um, if I haven't given everything I have today, I've lost that. Everything that you don't give, you lose. If I've expended everything, I haven't lost. I've given it, I can't lose it. I've given it. Another one I saw in there was, the harder you work, the easier it is to not surrender. I like that word. The harder you work, uh, the more effort you expend to help our brothers and sisters, the more effort you expend to feed the hungry and house the homeless and clothe the naked and visit the sick and those in prison, the more effort you expend to educate people, the harder it is to surrender because you're strong. It's easy to surrender if you're weak. It's easy to surrender if you set your sights low. One of the worst things that socialism does is that it extracts human incentive out of a person. There is no excellence in that system. And one of the things that you have to have in any country, any system, a football team, anything. 
You have to strive for excellence, one person at a time. Like the Army commercial says, be all you can be. Jesus said it himself, you must be perfected as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Perfection, excellence, whether it's in education, athletics, the business world, or the church, excellence is the only thing, and we've got to strive for it. And anything less than that is not in accord with the fullness of our human dignity, the first principle of the Catholic Church's social teaching. And so you and I have to be like good coaches. I, I've got a, a physical trainer now. She's not quite like some of the coaches that I've had in my life. My, my, co my football coach in high school was probably the most memorable of all the coaches I had because uh, I was in high school a while ago and things were different in those days. Um, <clears throat> I'll never forget, you know, we had a great football coach. We had a great tradition in my high school of football. We were a class B school, not a lot of students, but we often beat triple A schools in football. Why? We had a, a, a very, very excellent coach. Now, what made him so excellent? Well, he did know football, but he basically was a fundamentals kind of a guy. And I know the boys, oh, from about the age of 12, the only thing you, I could think of is I got to play football for Coach Hamlin. And so I started lifting weights and working out. And by the time I was 14, I weighed exactly what I weigh now. The only difference was I could bench press 300 pounds when I was 14, which is a lot of weight for a 14-year-old kid to bench press. So I was motivated. I had worked hard, <laughs> but I had no idea how much harder I was going to work. And I remember the first day was hot and humid in upstate New York. Went to the locker room, got issued our equipment, went down to the practice field. Assistant coaches had us running laps around the field, then lined us up. And down the hill came the bear. Coach Hamlet. He was dressed in his formal football attire, which meant Bermuda shorts and a ragged T-shirt. He was the biggest, hairiest man I had ever seen. And he stood in front of us, and he said, laps. And he made us run around the field. And then he stopped us and he made us run wind sprints the length of the football field until men began to collapse. One after the other, they were throwing up. Now, this was the old days before lawsuits. <laughs> and when everybody was in a sufficient state of exhaustion, the bear hovered over to us and smiled and said, Welcome to football, ladies. And it went down downhill from there. He ran us ragged. He was a perfectionist. You know, out of the, the Vince Lombardi school of perfection, that meant hard work. That meant fundamentals. Day after day, double sessions, hot, humid, run, run, run. We were in a, almost in a state of mutiny. We wanted to revolt. Finally, the night of the first game came. We played night games. I was one of two freshmen that was allowed to dress and play on the varsity team. Well, we went out that night, and we won 62 to nothing. We were coming off the field, going into the locker room, and a collective light bulb went on. And we realized what the coach had done for us. We realized that he had taken a bunch of well-meaning but undisciplined kids 
and he helped to turn us into winners. And he instilled in us a work ethic. And that if you want victory, you will expend blood, sweat, and tears. And there will be no victory if there is not a torrent of blood, sweat, and tears in anything. Whether it's on a football team, whether it's in a military unit, whether it's in the corporate world, whether it's in your family, whether it's in your country or your parish, you will have to expend some perspiration and some blood and some effort if you want to win. That's called excellence. And the teaching, the social teaching of the Catholic Church wants every human being to strive for excellence. We want to have a situation, we want to cultivate a society where everyone can come to the fullness of their human potential. And anything less than that is insufficient. Mediocrity is the curse of our generation. Excellence is what we have to strive for. And so remember, love God above all things with your whole heart, mind, and strength. And then love your neighbor as yourself out of love for God. Remember that it's Jesus in every poor person. Feed the hungry. House the homeless. Visit the sick, the elderly, those in prison. Don't neglect these things. If we neglect these things, we neglect our salvation. If as a society we neglect these things, we imperil our affluence. You know, if you have anything, the best way to preserve it is to give some of it away. I do that. You know, I, I admit that I have assets. You know, I don't, uh, I'm, I'm not tax exempt. Some people ask me, I did a television interview, the guy said, uh, how come you're not tax exempt like everybody else? I said, because when the government tells me in order to preserve my tax exemption, I can't talk about abortion, gay marriage, or whatever else, I can tell them, kiss my butt. In plain English. Sorry, but, you know, that, that's the way it is. I, you don't think you're going to get something for nothing. So, you know, that's just the way I do it. I'm not saying somebody else has to do it that way. But I, I like you, I work. I own a media company. The media company sells stuff. They, 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 every once in a while, these, these uh, media people, they try to aggravate me. So where's the money go? I said, in my bank account. Where does yours go? And then, if I've got any brains at all, and if I live in accordance with the church's teaching, and I do do this, you give some of it away. You take care of the poor. You give to the good, the, the good works of the church. You know, you feed the hungry. You house the homeless. You, 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 you share your wealth. Because there's a universal destination of goods. All of humanity has a right to the goods in creation. However, that doesn't mean you, have, you can just go out and steal somebody else's, the fruits of his labor, no. There is a universal destination of goods, but there is a right to the ownership of private property. So you work hard, you accrue some assets, you take care of your family, and then you share that with those less fortunate than yourself. This is not rocket science I'm talking about here, folks. You know all this stuff. But we have to be reminded of it, and we have to do it. And so please, remember these things. Remember that it's Jesus in every poor person. Remember that hungry guy, that homeless man, the prostitute, the drug addict, the alcoholic, the person down on their luck. Try to see Jesus 
in that person, and it will help you to live the social teaching of the church. And so we come to the end of this uh, four-part series on the social teaching of the church. I'm going to bless all the religious articles now, uh, so just make that intention. You don't have to take them out. You can if you want, but I'm going to do that very quickly before we have Mass. Heavenly Father, your word suffices to make all things holy. In Jesus' name, we ask you to pour down your blessing upon these various religious objects. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My dear friends, I ask you for a favor, and I'll return it. Please pray for me. St. Paul used to ask the churches to pray for him. Pre please pray for me that I won't wimp out. Please pray for me that I will preach the gospel as I ought. I, in turn, will pray for you. God love you. God bless you. And goodbye.